Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. This is our morning transmission and I have with us Professor M.D. Nalapar. We're going to be talking about two main things. One is, of course, Victoria Newland is, uh, is being eased out of the Department of State. Is she headed for bigger things or is it a black mark on what she has been doing? What we will know more from Professor M.D. Nalapar. Next, we're going to talk about China's uh, trying to, you know, uh, in, uh, encircle India, gridlock India. Uh, how successful is it and how is India finding a way around that? First, please like this video. I have, uh, I'm indebted to Professor Nalapat for coming at such short notice to talk about these two important things. Professor Nalapat, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Thank you, Sri. Professor Nalapat, let's jump straight. There was an article that you had written in Sunday Guardian which squarely blamed Victoria Newland for slow walking visas coming towards India. I mean, the visas from China were taking four days, whereas from India it was taking 100 times more, if not more. Um, Professor Nalapat, do you think Victoria Newland has finally, you know, burned all her bridges and has been eased out or has she retired? but she's headed for bigger things. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, in my view, she has been eased out. There's no question about it. Uh, and, you know, and thank you for referring to my article, which I think I wrote quite some time ago, Sri. Uh, I think the date would be uh, clear to you. Uh, uh, it was quite some time ago because uh, good friends in the United States uh, who were involved in such matters told me that it was Victoria Nuland who masterminded the operation to ensure that Indians never get a visa to go to the United States, quote, unquote. And frankly, I mean, it happened. You know, uh, the visas uh, issued slowed to a crawl. Of course, uh, the uh, Biden administration made excuses. Oh, we have less staff. We have this. We have that. Well, the fact is that a Chinese uh, national, a PRC national, uh, could get a visa in four days and an Indian could not get a visa in four years. So what that did to many families uh, who have got family in the United States is incalculable harm, quite frankly. And I was briefed by, by a very senior individual who knows these matters. That was Victoria Nuland who was pushing this because of India's uh, very, very clear and correct stance on Ukraine. So I wrote that article and I think, I mean, you know, uh, actually after that, I, I must say that things moved very fast. And in about six to eight months, that, that backlog started getting clear. Today, we are back to the old situation. Uh, visas are freely available and India is being treated like the largest democracy in the world, which it is, uh, frankly, by the Biden administration. But this is the lady who single-mindedly threw a monkey wrench into the entire gamut of people-to-people -people relations between India and the United States. She's the person who masterminded this effort in the State Department. And I'm only sorry to say that you have a person like Tony Blinken. Tony Blinken, I'm told, is a wonderful chap. You invite him for dinner or for lunch. <clears throat> He's a marvelous companion. But the man has no clue as to geopolitics. He has no clue as to what his priority should be. And he basically just stood aside while this lady, you know, uh, did a, uh, wielded a wrecking ball. Thank you, sir. I, I thought you were going on and then I realized I was muted. Thank you so much. Well, Professor Nalapat, you know, we both, uh, before we started this conversation, we were talk talking about it. And you mentioned about how Victoria Newland was acting like a useful idiot for China. Viewers, this is not a phrase, it's, it's not to say that somebody is an idiot. It is some, a phrase that has been termed by Lenin. You need to go back to Lenin's communism days to understand what that phrase means. Sir, a little bit more perspective on that. Look, the fact of the matter is free that today we are in the 21st century. It's a century of the Indo-Pacific, no longer the Atlantic. In the center of the Indo-Pacific Alliance, no longer the Atlantic Alliance. But you have Europeanists, if I may say so. And you have a lot of Americans who are actually American by passport. And of course, many of them have European passports as well. But who are basically believe that they are still Europeans on the other side of the Atlantic. 
And these people are unwilling to let go of the fact that times have changed. Geopolitics has changed. Asia is now the important continent, not Europe. The Indo-Pacific is the important theater, no longer the Atlantic. Victoria Nuland is part of that, except that she has an obsession with, with Russia, an absolute um, a pathological obsession with Russia. And this is something much to the liking of China, because China would like to see, you know, this red herring situation in which you basically chase out something that is not really a problem and you leave the real problem aside. You remember George W. Bush chased after Saddam Hussein and he started telling the whole world Saddam Hussein is the, is the head of Al-Qaeda. I mean, the poor man, either he didn't read his briefing memos or his briefing memos are horribly wrong. Saddam Hussein was one of the prime four, top five targets of Al-Qaeda. How could he be the head of Al-Qaeda? Anyway, that he chased that and today, and you've seen what happened in 2021, the ignominious defeat of the United States in Afghanistan. I want to ask you a frank question, you know, Shri. Who is going to trust the United States security partner after it left 3 million Afghans who had helped the United States and NATO in the lurch, just ran away, ran away as fast as their heels could take them and left behind even valuable assets. That is the Bagram Air Base. I don't know what Trump would have done. Trump signed the surrender document. I am frankly, that is a disgusting thing to do. And Trump will be judged in history for having uh, signed the surrender document through his Secretary of State. But the fact is Biden implemented it. And he had a pell-mell retreat from Afghanistan, which was, I mean, it was even worse than the retreat from Vietnam. And after that, frankly, who is going to trust the United States as security partner? I mean, I don't know. Uh, at least so long as you've got President Biden as the, as, the, you know, as the head of the military in the United States, it's going to be difficult. So I, I only want to say the Chinese have been working very, very hard through their social media control, the control over the social media. Remember, years ago, you, uh, I had discussed about the fact that, you know, you've got the Chinese social media narratives in which people are taught to hate their own country and to regard China as a very benign, the CCP as very benign. That is playing out in real time. The good news is more and more people are aware of that. I had talked about algo warriors, if you remember. And now more and more people are getting aware of these algo warriors. But the fact of the matter is the Chinese want to see the West go after Russia. They are doing everything in their power to plant anti-Russian disinformation, misinformation, and of course, information uh, in, to the United States and to Europe and to all the members of NATO. They are working very hard because they would like to see NATO go after Russia. And for them, Ukraine was a godsend. Ukraine was a huge diversion, as big a diversion or a much bigger than George Bush's diversion to Iraq. I'm not saying Saddam Hussein should not have been removed. He, it's good that he was removed. He was a tyrant. He was a dictator. He needed to be removed. George Bush did the world a favor by removing him. George Bush did the, a favor uh, by, by ensuring that the Northern Alliance took over the Taliban. And, 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 and defeated the Taliban. But after what happened, after that, the U.S. suffers defeat after victory. It suffered that in Afghanistan. It suffered that in Iraq. And so what I want to say is Victoria Nuland is somebody who has de facto helped the Chinese plan of making the West completely Russophobic, of focusing not on Xi, but on Putin, on focusing not on, on China, but on Russia, on focusing not on the Indo-Pacific, but on the Atlantic. And I don't think she did this because she's, a, she's paid by China. I don't think so. I mean, obviously, you know, there must be a, a lot of uh, institutions who are funding her. I don't think there is, I, I would not say that she has got any malign motive in accepting that funding. There's no harm in that. But the reality is, De facto, she is what Lenin called a useful idiot. An idiot because she does not realize she's a pawn of the Chinese game. 
useful because she's diverting attention away from China to Russia. And you remember, Sri, you and I have discussed this. And from the beginning of this ridiculous Biden-Johnson crusade in Ukraine, I have said it's a lost cause. Zelensky will be lucky to escape with the status quo. And what has happened after two years of bloody conflict in which hundreds of thousands of lives have, in my view, been affected and a large part of them have been killed. Hundreds of thousands have been wounded. Incalculable damage has been done to logistics change across the world. People are starving around the world because of these ridiculous sanctions on, on Russia by the EU, by NATO, by the United States, by this Biden-Johnson war, which frankly is completely against the interest of the United States. And it gives China a free pass. Victoria Nuland was one of the great strategic minds behind that war. Victoria Nuland, I'm not ascribing any malign motive to her. She probably thinks she's a gift to the world and a gift to the United States and a gift to democracy. But the fact is, she's a gift to the CCP. And she has frankly harmed the US interest, harmed the interest of joint working of the democracies, harmed the interest of confronting the CCP very, very badly by the reckless way in which she's supercharged uh, a complacent, if I may say so, Tony Blinken and frankly, Jake Sullivan. Jake Sullivan is another chap who's a very nice guy, very sweet chap. Again, I would like to say a wonderful dinner companion, I'm sure, a lunch companion. I don't, I think I remember about 20 years ago coming across him, but not after that. But he struck me as a nice, inoffensive sort of chap. And that's what he is. Frankly, Biden has got around him a lot of people who are sweet chaps and very low wattage where modern geopolitics is concerned. They're all stuck in the past and they're stuck completely in the past. And this is the tragedy, frankly, of Joe Biden, that, he's, that, that you have all these people who are stuck in the past. And Victoria Nuland was one of the key players behind this Ukraine disaster. I don't know who was a key player behind the Afghan disaster of George W. Bush, in which, frankly, he and Cheney embraced Musharraf. Now, my column on Sunday Guardian and Sunday is going to come out. How the Chinese and the Pakistanis helped the Taliban through narcotics, through prostitution, through various other ways. It's going to come out on Sunday. You better watch out for it. I'm not going to tell you anything more. But you have a CIA, you have the DIA, you have the defense. I mean, you have the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. You have the FBI. What are these guys doing? Couldn't they know that in Afghanistan there was a concerted effort? Uh, uh, sorry, Sri, please go ahead. Professor MD, and have you heard of a lobbying firm called Macro Advisory Partners? Uh, I'm afraid I've not. See, there are three leading lights in the current Biden administration who all used to work for global adv advisory partners. I'm sorry, global uh, macro advisory partners. Sorry, macro advisory partners. And they are Jake Sullivan, Victoria Newland, and um, the current C CIA uh, director. Now, if you go back and dig a little further, Macro advisory partners, operating partners who are right now very active. One is an Iranian American. The other one is a Pakistani American. Now you connect the dots, Professor Nalapar, and tell me that this should come as no surprise. I was one of the few who connected the dots and said, wait a minute, how come the United States foreign policy is so twisted? Now, viewers, I hope you understand the art, the monologue I did on macro advisory partners was at least three to six months ago. I mean, Professor Nalapat, I am shocked at the blindness that the media is displaying towards this administration. It is inexcusable. This is in plain sight. This is in plain sight. And, and these are the three people, if you look at it, you mentioned too, I, I didn't tell you that these are part of the macro advisory partners. 
Now you can see who is running the foreign policy in, in the Biden administration. I mean, are you ever going to wake up and smell the coffee, President? Anyway, so this is just a, 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 a teaser. If you have something to add, please feel free, feel free, sir. Otherwise, we'll go to the next topic. No, I just want to say that I'm surprised that, uh, first of all, that when Bush and Cheney spurned the offer by Prime Minister Vajpayee to assist the United States in Afghanistan and embraced Musharraf. And what did Musharraf do? Musharraf pushed the narcotics cartel and he made junkies out of so many American soldiers. And then, of course, the Chinese came in, many of the bars and brothels in Europe and North America. Well, many of them, if you look deeply at or how they have been set up, many of the charming individuals who are working in them, you will find a direct link to the CCP. And this is the way they have operated. And they operated in, uh, in Afghanistan in that manner. With the result by about 2006, 2007, the war was lost. The war was lost because of the internal rot of the fact that you had intelligence flowing from your so-called friends. The, the Chinese were great friends of, your, of the United States. The Pakistanis were, army was great friends of the United States. You didn't check about the, who was controlling the narcotics trade. It was precisely from within these two countries. Who was controlling the prostitution? Who was controlling the locatious talk? When somebody is high on narcotics and high on alcohol, he talks and discusses so many things. It went straight back to the Taliban. It was, uh, it was packaged properly and in a sense, you know, it was presented in a form that the Taliban could understand. It went straight back to the Taliban. Just as intelligence went back, if you remember, we had mentioned about after the dastardly attack of October 7 by Hamas, uh, the intelligence about what is happening on the Israeli side of the border came from a superpower. That's all I said in Sunday Guardian uh, a day or two after the attack. It is obvious what the superpower, who the superpower was, and you're talking. We are talking about Hamas. Have you read the school textbooks of Hamas, Sri? Have you read the textbooks that describe what the Jewish people are, what the Christian people are? Please read them. You will understand exactly how the young in Hamas, I mean in Gaza, have been indoctrinated by the control of Hamas. Sorry. By the same. By the, by the same coin, I would urge all of the Indian political leadership to listen to what gets spoken in the madrasas in and around the country. It, it begins here. The venom is being spread right here. Yeah, Please, about the United States, again. I, yeah. uh, especially under this administration. Sri, you and I have talked about the sino Wahhabi lobby. I have talked about the WK virus more than two decades ago. That is the Khomeinist Wahhabi virus. I don't see any difference between Khomeinism and Wahhabism. They are, they are basically two sides of the same coin. They are, do not represent Shia Islam. They do not represent Sunni Islam, but they pretend to represent both. And fortunately, Saudi Arabia has broken free of, of Wahhabism under Mohammed bin Salman, which is why when, frankly, you know, your part of the world was abusing Mohammed bin Salman day in and day out. I was defending him because this is the first Al Saud to stand up and say Wahhabism is evil. It should be finished off. And I hope somebody will come up like that who will run Iran and say Khomeinism is evil. It has demolished uh, you know, the, uh, the, the good things in Iran and it needs to be changed. That is going to happen, I'm sure. But the fact of the matter is the Sino Wahhabi lobby is very active in your country and mine. Very, very active in your country. And it is this lobby that is influencing matter. I don't believe that Jake Sullivan or the other chap, the CIA director, realized who was behind this kind of funding. The fact is that, you know, I mean, the United States is, uh, is giving uh, China about a trillion dollars in direct and indirect assistance a year, for God's sake. You know, it's like American corporations, you know, putting money in a particular country in Central Europe in the 1930s and 1920s. They poured money into that particular country. And you know what happened? That's exactly what you guys are doing now. They got bananas out of it. <laughs> well, they look like monkeys. So they probably like the bananas.
Professor Nalapat, let's take a look at the attempts of China to gridlock India. What's happening in Bhutan? For example, Bhutan, there is a ransom play. In, in Nepal, they seem to be able to effect a government change at will. And they have recently signed a defense deal with Maldives. With the exception of Sri Lanka, and again, Sri Lanka is the probably outlooking in. I don't know what exactly is the relationship between Sri Lanka and China. So where do you see this thing? China is definitely trying to gridlock India. How is India going to respond? Look, I would like to say one thing, Sri, and that is, I would like to see a strengthened quad, a quad by securities of the core of operations and technology, development of technology, development of good health, all the other matters that the Quad is dealing with are actually intrinsic security. So it's already a security-based alliance. Unfortunately, the Sino-Wahhabi lobby within your country is basically slow walking the Quad. The Sino-Wahhabi lobby has been active in Australia as well. Frankly, it's active in Japan as well. And uh, they have been trying to slow walk the Quad. But we need to fast walk the Quad and develop that. As far as China is concerned, frankly, Time is against China. Keep that in mind. You are talking about a country that has got a demographic disaster staring in the face. China is talking about remaining as the manufacturing hub. How are you going to remain the manufacturing hub when you're already a middle-aged nation? Manufacturing needs young people. You're talking about being an information technology hub. First of all, you've got a repressive system. Uh, frankly, no repressive system. Uh, you know, you don't have a great knowledge infrastructure from a repressive system. I, I write, I'm, I'm here in, in, in my university in Manipal. I, I, a lot of my books have been written here and in, in Trivandrum. Why? Because you have a, a lovely a culture where you can write. And I must say the United States, even today, where, where has that kind of culture, except that you're a bit too expensive for guys like me to come there and spend very much time there. But the fact is, China doesn't have it. So I only want to tell you one thing very, very clearly. The Sino-Wahhabi lobby is active. And they are the ones who are trying to uh, ensure that you are still locked in the old Cold War. Now, I'm not worried. Because first of all, the Chinese are getting older, older, older. The number of young people are getting smaller, smaller, smaller. The young people who are there are not fighters, I can tell you. And the young people are there in a repressive regime where they have to keep walk. They don't know tomorrow who will go to jail on the basis of what flippant comment was made. And as a consequence, I think China is already on a downward slope. There is no question about it. But that does not mean it is not dangerous. When a country is on a downward slope, it becomes the most dangerous. You remember, you know, Germany thought it had it did not have time on its side. Hitler had the view that he was not going to last very long. And he had this delusion. The man was uh, psychotic that without him, Germany would not uh, I mean, uh, succeed at all. Now, the same way, for example, you know, she has that delusion that without him, uh, China will not succeed. The CCP will not succeed. So the fact of the matter is China has already started its decline. Number one, India has launched its ascent. The last 10 years of Narendra Modi have been a period of frank, of, you know, first five years, clear away debris, second five years, build the foundation, and the next five years, which hopefully will come when the next general election comes in two months from now, will be the period of rapid building. So I'd like to say we are on the ascendant, they are on the descendant. But that does not mean they are not, they are not dangerous. Look at the South China Sea. Look at what China is doing to the Philippines. Even CNN, I mean, China News Network, frankly. CNN is, I mean, should be renamed China News Network. It's not cable. I mean, it is tied by cables to the to Beijing narrative on Ukraine, for example. This is the narrative the Chinese want. They create, you know, West phobia in Russia and Russophobia uh, uh, in, in the West. But... The, the, the fact of the matter is, I can tell you, Sri, that I, the Chinese are on a decline. Xi Jinping, the biggest mistake he made was his third term. Because now he has to have a fourth term. Without a fourth term, it's very unlikely he's going to be a free man. 
uh, once his third term is over. People are very upset with him. So he needs a fourth term. He needs something spectacular. Look at the South China Sea, the Philippines, the boats are being attacked. Naval boats are being attacked. What is Joe Biden doing about it? What is Lloyd Austin doing about it? They're, I mean, essentially, I don't know, going to a baseball game and, and munching on peanuts. Nothing. What a humiliating disgrace that a treaty ally of yours is being left to fend for itself against China and the United States Navy, which comes in force to protect Nancy Pelosi. As soon as Pelosi left, the Navy left. Taiwan is not important. And then you have this ridiculous budget in which you spend $60 billion for Ukraine because you're all, you know, you all believe Europe is the center of the world. And if you're not European, then frankly, you're subhuman. That's the, the, the I mean, that is the perception that, that, that has driven 60 billion for Ukraine. Pennies for Taiwan. How much is Taiwan getting free? Nothing. What kind of modern weapons Taiwan getting? Nothing compared to what it needs. Pennies for Israel. How much is Israel getting? Nothing compared to what the Ukraine is getting. And who is more important to you? Is it the, 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 uh, the Taiwanese, the Israelis, or the Ukrainians? For God's sake, Sri, I've been saying from the very beginning of this ridiculous war, 2014, 2022, that even if the whole of Ukraine is completely under the control of Vladimir Putin, it is hardly going to impact Western security. Ukraine is important only if NATO wants to invade by land the United the, the, the Russia. And I don't think even NATO is stupid enough to do that. NATO, they have broken records in stupidity. But I don't think they're that stupid. Otherwise, Ukraine is not a big strategic price. But the fact is to the Newlands, to the Blinkens, to the Sullivans, to people who believe Europe is the center of the universe, the navel of the universe. Yes, Ukraine is important because they're European. Not, not, not Israel, not Taiwan, but not, the, not Saudi Arabia under Mohammed bin Salman, a country that is now re completely remodeling itself. You know, the, India is going through transformation. And I'm happy to say Mohammed bin Salman and Mohammed bin Zayed of the UAE. These are two amazingly transformational leaders in the Middle East, and they're transforming their countries, their young countries, and that India is a young country. China is already a middle-aged country. In 20 years, it's going to become an old country, let me tell you. But in the next five or six years, as it is going down the slope, it is going to become more and more dangerous. South China Sea, United States already shown in action that it considers it a Chinese lake. The Chinese can hassle and harass a treaty ally. And all that you, you do is munch peanuts in some football stadium or some movie theater. It's an utter disgrace. Your withdrawal in Afghanistan is a disgrace. Asking 60 billion for Ukraine and pennies for Taiwan and pennies for Ukraine for Israel is a disgrace. And what is happening to Manila? Here you have you know, um, 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 Bong Bong Marcos standing up to China. I wish that Joe Biden would stand up to China one tenth of the way that President Marcos is standing up to China. It will be a different world if Joe Biden got that kind of spine. But I don't see that kind of spine. And frankly, even if the Republicans come, so many of them are so embedded with China in terms of money, money, money through so many ways. I'm not sure you'll see much of a difference there either, quite frankly. The Sino-Wahhabi lobby and now the Wahhabis and the Khomeinis are working together. So it's now one big happy family, the Khomeinis, the Wahhabis and the Sino, the CCP lobby. All three are working together. And I'm sorry to say whether the Democrats are awful, the Republicans are slightly less awful. It's a choice between less awful and awful. But the reality is, Face up to the, who are facing up to it? The American people. They are facing up to it. And they will someday, you're going to have honest people writing history. You're not going to have self serving histories like Bob Woodward, who completely ignored what I just mentioned to you. The way narcotics was pumped 
uh, into Afghanistan to infect U.S. soldiers. The way brothels and bars were used as information collecting mechanisms. Has Woodward mentioned that? No. These sanitized versions of history will disappear. The truth will come out. And when that comes out, I can tell you, uh, the people are going to understand what the way they have been basically sold down the river by the leaders that they have elected to power. Your, the people of the United States, I mean, the people of Europe. Thank you so much, Professor Nalapad. If you have a few minutes, we can take a few questions. There are lots of yes, questions, certainly. as a matter of fact, but maybe a few questions we can take. Yeah, please read it out, Sri. Yeah. Uh, Jayant Mistri, yeah. thank you so much for becoming a YouTube member. Chaitanya Takle wants to know, how do you see Pakistan under Sharif Asim Munir now? Look, the fact is that Imran Khan won the election. The West may not acknowledge it. Imran Khan won the election. The man is in jail. The people of Pakistan are moving. And in my view, quite frankly, this is as big a mistake as was made by in the past when Yahya Khan basically you know, ignored the fact that Sheikh Mujibur Rahman should be the, the Prime Minister of Pakistan and put Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. This gentleman, Shabash Sharif, is the new Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and the process of in which Balochistan, Sindh, the Pashtuns, I have immense regard for the Pashtuns. You see what's happening in Afghanistan. They are refusing to go under kowtow to Pakistan. So the two factions of Taliban under Pakistan control have shriveled. They become insignificant. The faction of China has become insignificant. The free Taliban have become very powerful. So frankly, that process has started. Shabash Sharif is going to preside over the Pakistan uh, uh, in, in a way that was reminiscent of what happened when Yahya Khan a, you know, basically ignored a free election. A, in, in Pakistan, despite a rigged election, it is Imran Khan's choice who should have been made the Prime Minister. Mr. Ayub, if he, that had happened, there would have been some hope for, uh, for, the, for that country. Today, I can tell you, it is going to go down the tube. And my only request to my very old friends in China, please spend $500, $600 million dollars billion dollars on Pakistan. Please spend as much money as you can on Pakistan. It will all go down the tube. But I think as old friends, steadfast friends, you know, day and night friends, uh, rainy weather or sunshiny weather friends, I think, I think she should spend at least $600 billion in helping Pakistan, in helping Shabash Sharif, in helping Asim Munir. Please spend that money you know, uh, President Xi, but I don't think he's going to spend anything. He himself is in deep trouble. I can't hear I you. I apologize for that. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Nalapat, I just did one monologue of 59 seconds, just an hour before on what is happening in Pakistan. You may want to listen to this, sir. It's very interesting. There's never a dull moment in Pakistan politics. Now news is trickling in. That just give me one second, sir. I need to reset. There's never a dull moment in Pakistan politics. Now news is trickling in that Imran Khan was again offered the post of Prime Minister. Of course, there were a lot of independents that were backing him and he refused and Shahbaz Sharif got the post. One thing we do know is that in KPK, that is Khyber Pakhtunwa, there was uh, very little rigging because the people did not allow the army to do any kind of rigging. However, they went ahead and rigged somewhere else where they could have more access to the voting uh, system, like the 45, Form 45 and things like that. But what difference does it make, whether it is Imran Khan, yeah, Shehbaz Sharif, the country has already gone to dogs. So what is significant is that Imran feels that he may be able to get the power back in his hands in maybe a democratic way. Your comment, sir. I only want to say that I have sources in Pakistan, main uh, good sources, I have sources in various countries, basically based on 
sometimes decades of friendship. And we discuss, I'm completely outside government, nothing to do with any government, frankly, uh, in any state or in the country or anywhere else. I'm, uh, and I, in, I believe I was the earliest person to draw, write about superpower India and India first. And I think that's, a, I mean, we are, our country is going to become a superpower. And I'm very happy that Prime Minister Modi of India. Let me tell you, this is complete uh, misinformation. The reality is... I know what word you are going for. I know what word you are going for. It's all right. <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't want to use that word because... Uh, <laughs> you know, it has eight letters and starts with the letter B and well, ends with the letter T. Go ahead, sir. I, it's all right. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really saying... Imran Khan was never offered that. The fact of the matter is, as I had mentioned at that point in time, if he had kissed the feet of Asim Munir, yes, he would have been made the prime minister. He refused to. This is one man who has stood firm. And he has, And then there was a, a, a so-called Imran, you know, clone talking. That is not Imran Khan talking. Oh, welcome the election. Wonderful election. It was stolen from him. And I immediately pointed out that this is bluff. This is deliberate army uh, with the help of the Chinese technology. They have created this wrong image to calm people down. The fact is, Asim Munir has lost the election. Imran Khan has won. And may I say that I think as far as, you know, he was never offered the prime ministership. Absolutely. This is again part of that uh, misinformation campaign, if I may say so. The reality is the army is terrified of Imran Khan because, as you correctly said, the people of Pakistan respect Imran Khan a lot more than they do the army. And the reason they respect is they have contempt for the army now and they respect a man with spine. So long as Imran shows that spine, I can tell you, they will continue to respect him. The question is, what can be done? Can he be hanged like Bhutto? It will create a problem. Can he be kept in jail, you know, silent? It will be a problem. Can he be released? It will be a problem. Asim Munir is in a dilemma. He no longer can fool the people of Pakistan that India is the enemy. The Pakistan military and its Wahhabi, Khomeinist, CCP allies are the enemy of the people of Pakistan. And increasingly, the people have realized it. And the real winner of that election is in jail in Pakistan, incommunicado. You talk about Alexei Navalny, all the Western media. Navalny, poor fellow, never got more than one and three quarters of one percent approval in, in Russia. The guy is a minor fry. He is no threat to Vladimir Putin at all. He was made into a huge hero by the West, by the Newlands of the world, and by the, I mean, uh, I'm not going to call them useful idiots, but the uh, you know New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, Make it Guardian, useless then. <laughs> Guardian, all these guys who bought that thing that Navalny is a huge mass leader. You know he can overpower Putin any time. Everybody loves him. He's some kind of a Jay Prakash Narayan. You look at Navalny's background; he's a complete Nazi. He's the fascist. He basically has had thousands of times he has abused and insulted those of an ethnicity different from European ethnicity. This is Navalny. You, co you quote Navalny to Navalny. And, and this chap, fortunately, the Russian people are sensible people. Not more than one and three fourth percent approval at the highest. He was no threat to Putin at all. And the worst thing that could happen to Putin was him but dying at that point in time. Clearly, somebody who interrogated him, somebody who looked after him in jail, made a horrible mistake. There's no question about it. I don't believe there's any intention of killing him deliberately, but the man died and definitely the consequence of his imprisonment. But to say that he was a threat to Vladimir Putin is like saying that the loss of Ukraine is a threat to Western civilization. Ukraine was in the Soviet Union for so long. Did Western civilization collapse and melt down? Joe Biden was around as a senator. Did he feel himself melting down? Well, when the Ukraine was the Soviet Union, I would like to ask all these you know, uh, the, the ladies and gentlemen, this is ridiculous. Frankly, Imran Khan was not offered that job and the, he is keeping his spine. He is continuing to stand against the military. So long as he does so, 
He'll be admired by the people of Pakistan. But what Imran Khan is doing is basically serving as a catalyst for all those who say they want to end the oppression of the Sino-Wahhabi lobby, the oppression of GHQ Rawal Pindi on the people of Pakistan. I personally believe that you're going to see, now you're seeing in a sense, mass non-cooperation. Shabash Sharif is not going to be able to succeed at all. But again, I repeat, anybody who wants to put money down that bottomless pit, do so. Welcome. And I, I'm not sure the United States will, because poor, poor, poor Joe Biden is so obsessed with Ukraine. He, whatever money he can squeeze from the American taxpayer, he's put into Ukraine. And that is what is killing Joe Biden politically, the Ukraine war, the high cost because of the sanctions of the Ukraine war. The fact that African-Americans are correctly asking, you're ready to spend 60 billion on Ukraine. Why didn't you spend that on raising the, you know, the education and other facilities and empowering African-Americans who are your most loyal supporters? African-Americans are a vibrant, wonderful community. You empower them and they'll be absolutely tops. Why can't Biden spend 40 billion? Frankly, as I said before, I think in an American platform, that 40 billion of that 60 billion should go in your southern border. You're getting Wahhabis coming in, Khomeinis coming in, CCP agents coming in. They're flooding the United States. Thank you so much, Professor Nalapat, and a very enlightening conversation. And we may have our uh, areas of disagreement, uh, but substantially we are in agreement. Once again, viewers, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to click on the bell button for notification. Professor Nalapat, I'm hoping that we'll come back in a couple of weeks' time. Namaskar. <laughs>